the world is changed. Accidental Death by Peter Bailey The most dangerous of weapons is the one you don't know is loaded. The wind howled out of the northwest, blind with snow and barbed with ice crystals. All the way up the half-mile precipice it fingered and wrenched away at groaning ice slabs. It screamed over the top, whirled snow in a dervish dance around the hollow there, piled snow into the long furrow, ploughed ruler straight through streamlined hummocks of snow. The sun glinted on black rock glazed by ice, chasms and ridges and bridges of ice. It lit the snow slope to a frozen glare, penciled black shadow down the long furrow and flashed at the furrow's end, on a thing of metal and plastics, an artefact thrown down in the dead wilderness. Nothing grew, nothing flew, nothing walked, nothing talked. But the thing in the hollow was stirring in stiff jerks, like a snake with its back broken, or a clockwork toy running down. When the movements stopped, there was a click, and a strange sound began. Thin, scratchy, inaudible, more than a yard away. Weary, but still cocky, there leaked from the shape in the hollow the sound of a human voice. <sighs> I've tried my hands and arms and they seem to work. It began. I wriggled my toes with entire success. It's well on the cards that I'm all in one piece and not broken up at all. Though I don't see how it could happen. Right now I don't feel like struggling up and finding out. I'm fine where I am. I'll just lie here for a while and relax. And get some of this story on tape. The suit's got a built-in recorder. I might as well use it. That way, even if I'm not as well as I feel, I'll leave a message. You'll probably know we're back and wonder what went wrong. I suppose I'm in a state of shock. That's why I can't seem to get up. Who wouldn't be shocked after luck like that? I've always been lucky, I guess. Luck got me a place in the whale. Sure, I'm a good astronomer, but so are lots of other guys. If I were ten years older... It would have been an honour being picked for the first long jump in the first starship ever. At my age, it was luck. You'll want to know if the ship worked. Well, she did. Went like a bomb. We got lined up between Earth and Mars, you'll remember, and James pushed the button marked jump, took his finger off the button, and there we were. Alpha Centauri. Two months later your time, one second later by us... We covered a whole survey assignment like that, smooth as a pint of old and mild, which right now I could certainly use. Better yet would be a pint of hot black coffee with sugar in. Failing that, I could even go for a long drink of cold water. There was never anything wrong with the whale, till right at the end, and even then I doubt it was the ship itself that fouled things up. That was some survey assignment. We astronomers really lived... Wait till you see. Oh, of course you won't. I could weep when I think of those miles of lovely colour film all gone up in smoke. I'm shocked, all right. I never said who I was. Matt Hennessy from Farside Observatory, back of the moon. Just back from a pivoting flight come astronomical survey in the starship Whale. Whoever you are who finds this tape, you're made... Take it to any radio station or newspaper office. You'll find you can name your price and don't take any wooden nickels. Where had I got to? I told you how we happened to find Chang, hadn't I? That's what the natives called it. 
Walking, talking natives on a blue sky planet with 1.1 g gravity and 20% oxygen atmosphere at 15 psi. The odds against finding Chang on a six sun survey of the first star jump ever must be up in the Googles. We certainly were lucky. The Chang natives aren't very technical. Haven't got space travel, for instance. They're good astronomers, though. We were able to show them our sun in their telescopes. In their way, they're a highly civilised people. Look more like cats than people. But they're people, all right. If you doubt it, chew these facts over. 1. They learnt our language in four weeks. When I say they, I mean a ten-man team of them. 2. They brew a near beer that's a lot nearer than the canned stuff we had aboard the whale. Three, they've got a great sense of humour. Ran rather to silly practical jokes, but still, can't say I care for that hot foot and belly laugh stuff myself, but tastes differ. Four, the ten-man language team also learned chess and table tennis. But why go on? People who talk English, drink beer, like jokes and beat me at chess or table tennis are people for my money, even if they look like tigers in trousers. It was funny the way they won all the time at table tennis. They certainly weren't so hot at it. Maybe that 10% extra gravity put us off our strokes. As for chess, Svendlov was our champion. He won sometimes. The rest of us seemed to lose whichever Chingzi we played. There again, it wasn't so much that they were good. How could they be in the time? It was more that we all seemed to make silly mistakes when we played them, and that's fatal in chess. Of course, it's a screwy situation playing chess with something that grows its own fur coat, has yellow eyes an inch and a half long, and long white whiskers. Could you have kept your mind on the game? And I don't think I fell victim to their feline charm. The children were pets, but you didn't feel like patting the adults on their big grinning heads. Personally... I didn't like the one I knew best. He was called, well, we called him Charlie. And he was the ethnologist, ambassador, contact man, or whatever you like to call him, who came back with us. Why I disliked him was because he was always trying to get the edge on you. All the time, he had to be the top. Great sense of humour, of course. I nearly broke my neck on that butter slide he fixed up in the metal alleyway down to the whale's engine room. Charlie laughed fit to bust. Everyone laughed. I even laughed myself, though doing it hurt me more than the tumble had. Yes, life and soul of the party, old Charlie. My last sight of the minnow was a cabin full of dead and dying men, the sweetish stink of burnt flesh and the choking reek of scorching insulation. The boat jolting and shuddering and beginning to break up, and in the middle of the flames, still unhurt, was Charlie. He was laughing. My God, it's dark out here. I wonder how high I am. Must be all of fifty miles, and doing eight hundred miles an hour at least. I'll be doing more than that when I land. What's final velocity for a fifty-mile fall? Same as a fifty-thousand-mile fall, I suppose. Same as escape. Twenty-four thousand miles an hour. I'll make a mess. That's better. Why didn't I close my eyes before? Those star streaks make me dizzy. I'll make a nice shooting star when I hit air. Come to think of it, I must be deep in air now. Let's take a look. It's getting lighter. Look at those peaks down there, like great knives. I don't seem to be falling as fast as I expected, though. Almost seem to be floating. Let's switch on the radio and tell the world hello. Hello, Earth. Hello again, and goodbye. Sorry about that. I passed out. I don't know what I said, if anything, and the suit recorder has no playback or eraser. What must have happened is that the suit ran out of oxygen and I lost consciousness due to anoxia. I dreamed I switched on the radio, but I actually switched on the emergency tank, thank the Lord, and that brought me round.